Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm Andy Zamaniris, the Executive Director of the Hellenic American Leadership Council, which is pleased to co-host, along with the Delphi Economic Forum and Kathy Merini, the fourth right? It's the fourth. COVID has thrown me off, but I think it's the fourth. Southeast Europe and East Med Forum. Uh, and we're actually, we're becoming regulars at the FDD. So first of all, I want to thank the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, uh, of, of Democracies for hosting us and putting together this star panel. For those of you who don't know FDD, for more than 20 years, FDD has operated as a nonpartisan policy institute focused on national security and foreign policy. It's a source for timely research, analysis, and policy options. Uh, they proudly take neither foreign government nor foreign corporate funding. Uh, they've done excellent work. We've been, it was been great to work with them on the East Med. They've been cutting edge on the East Med. And of course, because we have this podcast, this daily podcast uh, called The Greek Current, we have two of our favorite guests here, John Shanzer and Brad Bowman. Right. They are, I think John is edging you out, Brad, though, no, just tell you. <laughs> uh, um, and they put together a great panel for us about the challenges and opportunities in the region, in the Eastern Mediterranean, including how uh, developing institutions like the Abraham Accords and the East Med Gas Forum can lead to greater integration in the region. Uh, among the stars, first we have Ambassador Eric Edelman. Uh, Eric has had a long and distinguished career uh, in the US Foreign Service. He's served as U.S. Ambassador to Finland and Turkey. So you must have interesting conversations <laughs> with a lot of your colleagues, uh, as well as the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy and Pr Principal Deputy Assistant to the Vice President for National Security Affairs. He is a senior advisor at FDD and is currently serving as the Vice Chair of the National Defense Strategy Commission. Uh, Brad Bowman, who serves as Senior Director of FDD Center on Military and Political Power. He previously served as a National Security Advisor to members of the Senate Armed Services and Foreign Relations Committee, as well as an active duty U.S. Army officer, Black Hawk pilot, and assistant professor at West Point. And since this is co-hosted by the Delphi Economic Forum, I have to give Brad a little Delphic Oracle status because before... Uh, the Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Brad analyzed the, the new mutual defense and cooperation agreement uh, between Greece and the United States and, and threw out a, a nice little tidbit about how important Alexandropolis could become in case, uh, in case Turkey wanted to blockade or not uh, provide uh, free free passage through the Dardanelles. So you get the Delphic Oracle Award uh, over the last year, <laughs> Brad. Um, Dimitri Karidis, member of Hellenic Parliament, uh, representing Athens North and a professor of international politics at Pandion University of Athens. Um, he serves as the head of the Israel-Greece Friendship Parliamentary Group and is in the now launching, just authorized uh, last year by Congress, the three plus one interparliamentary uh, legislative committee uh, that on this side of the pond is headed by Senator Menendez. Jonathan, Jonathan Shanzer, my favorite Philadelphia Eagles fan, is, wants to remind us with his tie. Uh, he serves as senior vice president for research at FDD. Uh, he worked as a t terrorism finance analyst in the U.S. Department of the Treasury and has written four books on the Middle East, including let, was last year's book on the Gaza? 2020. 2020. <laughs> I told you, COVID threw me off, right? <laughs> uh, and finally, we're privileged to have as our moderator the incomparable Lena Yiri. <laughs> Lena is the Washington, D.C. correspondent for Eric, the Greek public broadcaster. In her role, she covers the White House, State Department, the Treasury, and Capitol Hill on issues related to Greece and the Eastern Mediterranean by providing commentary and articles in Greek 
media, including Kathy Merini. And sorry, Brad and John, but I think Lena is also infinitely more popular on the Greek current than you guys. Lena, over to you. Thank you, Andy, for the kind words. Thank you all for being here with us today. A special thanks to the FDD for hosting this event for second year in a row. And thank you, gentlemen, for taking the time today to help us better understand the very difficult region, the opportunities, the challenges, the difficulties, and the threats. Uh, Mr. Edelman, I would like to start with you. And we'll discuss today about a very complicated uh, region where the alliances and the dynamics uh, frequently change. Can you please help us understand why this region is historically important for US foreign policy? And I'm referring to both the littoral states as well as the Gulf countries. <clears throat> sure. Well, thank you, Lena. Thank you, Andy, for that uh, introduction. I, I think the emphasis on my career needs to be long because <laughs> I'm approaching, you know, sort of senescence now. So um, before I start and answer your question, Lena, I really think it is appropriate to start first with an observation about uh, the terrible tragedy that's befallen Turkey and Syria today with the two earthquakes and potentially, as I understand it, I'm not a seismologist and I don't play one on TV, but a as I understand it, there's potential because of instability along the fault lines there uh, for even more uh, and perhaps even stronger earthquakes in the uh, next uh, day or two. I would recall that in 1999, it was a similar kind of earthquake, although this one seems to be even stronger in terms of uh, the damage that it's done, um, that uh, brought about a, a, uh, a rapprochement between Greece and, and Turkey uh, because it emphasized, of course, the common human toll that these kinds of tragedies take. And so one can certainly hope uh, that if there's anything good that comes out of what uh, has happened uh, today that uh, we might see a bit of a reprise of that kind of uh, attention to the humanitarian costs of this on all sides. We tend to forget here in Washington anyway that uh, the Eastern Mediterranean has been an important strategic uh, you know, part of American uh, grand strategy for a long time, certainly dating back uh, to 1947. Um, and the onset of the Cold War. Um, and historically, of course, the Mediterranean was uh, Im important uh, international um, uh, waterway going back to the Greeks and Romans, but uh, the ancient Greeks and Romans. But um, for the United States, the passage of uh, British Im imperial power out of the region um, because of the economic burdens of World War II uh, forced the United States to take up uh, political responsibilities that it had heretofore uh, avoided um, when uh, when Britain uh, informed the United States it could no longer be responsible for the security of the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, both Greece and Turkey were going through uh, difficult challenges, Greece a civil war, um, and Turkey enormous pressure from the Soviet Union on the control of the of the Straits. And so uh, President Truman um, called for uh, American aid to countries withstanding uh, the forces of uh, totalitarianism. Uh, and the United States became uh, deeply involved. The broader region was important because the United States was trying to help Europe uh, in its reconstruction after World War II. Uh, and the energy resources from the uh, broader region were absolutely essential to the reconstruction of the European economy. And so the Eastern Mediterranean uh, took on a very important role. It was only a year later uh, that um, we had the beginnings of the North Atlantic Treaty uh, Organization. And of course, uh, one of the very first expansions of NATO, we talk a lot about NATO expansion in the context of Ukraine these days, but. The very first, one of the very first NATO expansions was the addition of Greece and Turkey uh, to, uh, to the alliance. Um, at the time of the Truman Doctrine speech and the Truman aid, uh, Secretary of State Dean Acheson, uh, who was actually, I think, undersecretary then, uh, testified in closed door session to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And he had to make the argument for aid to Greece and Turkey by noting that they were kind of imperfect democracies in, in each in its own way. 
Um, and certainly Greece has had uh, over the years challenges with democracy, particularly in the 60s and 70s. Uh, Turkey had not yet at that time had an election that would allow for the transfer of power. That was not to come until 1950. And of course, uh, Turkish democracy has been uh, undergoing uh, severe challenges in the last decade uh, plus with the creeping authoritarianism of, of President Erdogan. My view has always been that uh, the United States role uh, in that regard was try to help both Greece and Turkey and the region as a whole perfect its democracy um, and move in a, a more uh, democratic direction. But one thing about the importance of the region is that while it maintained its importance throughout the Cold War, and the United States maintained significant uh, military forces, particularly Navy forces, uh, in the Mediterranean, uh, since the end of the Cold War, there has been a kind of uh, loss of attention uh, to the importance of the region. Uh, and even the fact that the largest natural gas findings in the world uh, in this century have been uncovered in this part of the world, uh, I think it still lacks the kind of focused attention, certainly here in Washington, that it deserves. And we can talk more about you know, ways to uh, remedy that, but um, I, I think that the region retains uh, an important uh, role uh, and there are challenges to, in Washington to how we deal with that uh, that are bureaucratic that I can go into more detail on later. But um, I, I think that uh, we need to recover some of what we used to know which is that this is a very crucial part of the world uh, that can only suffer from American inattention. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Kiridis, Mr. Kiridis, okay. uh, regardless of uh, how complicated this uh, area is, and Mr. Edelman gave us a very good picture, uh, the, all the major transnational issues like uh, terrorism, uh, climate, energy, immigration are the same, are the same for all. And it seems to me that the only way through these challenges is uh, a multilateral regional approach. Uh, Greece has been quite active on that front. How successful have these initiatives been and what else needs to be done in order for this uh, regional uh, approach to truly take hold? Thank you very much, uh, Lena. It's wonderful to be here back uh, in DC, thanks to the kind invitation of the Delphi Forum and my friend Eddie. Um, and it's always great to have this opportunity for a dialogue, for a transatlantic uh, dialogue in this trouble of uh, uh, change and uh, trouble that we have with this esteemed uh, panel. Uh, now, we are in a foundation for the defense of uh, democracy and uh, I think I would uh, state uh, uh, the obvious, uh, saying that uh, uh, the most important election uh, in 2023 uh, for American interests, for Western interests, for uh, Europe, for Greece, uh, for everybody uh, in the area is obviously the Turkish uh, uh, election. And uh, it is true that we have seen a lot of, uh, to put it mildly, uh, democratic backsliding uh, in uh, uh, Turkey recently. Now, as a representative of the Greek uh, people, I want as well to express my uh, uh, greatest uh, sympathy and condolences for the humanitarian disaster that has uh, struck uh, Turkey. And already I have been uh, on uh, uh, the air urging my fellow Greeks, the Greek government has already announced uh, immediate aid uh, uh, to Turkey and for Europe as well to take the lead. Uh, this uh, can have a significant political meaning as well, as a political gesture, uh, because we have seen with great anxiety uh, the cultivation of an anti-Western, anti-European, anti-Greek, anti-American, very xenophobic uh, discourse uh, in Turkey as part of uh, Erdogan's uh, uh, election campaign. Um, that Turkey is a victim of uh, bad foreigners, uh, the imperialists, um, the infidels, I don't know what, uh, uh, the Greeks as the American uh, um, um, stooges in the uh, uh, area. And we have to send the message that we are here to help, uh, that we are open uh, to this kind of uh, cooperation. We are very firm 
uh, in uh, defending uh, the law, but at the same time we extend a hand of uh, uh, um, a cooperation at this time of great need. Uh, in a region of Turkey that is poor, uh, that uh, houses uh, a lot of uh, uh, Syrian refugees, um, the weather is very, very cold, and so the chances of surviving uh, in the rubble uh, are quite uh, slim. And we haven't seen anything yet. I think uh, the victims will go up uh, in the tens of thousands, uh, given the force of the earthquake. And the um, usual predicament, uh, problems in uh, uh, how buildings are built, uh, in this great economic boom of Turkey, o o o often uh, uh, rules and regulations are uh, uh, disregarded. Uh, 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 there is a lot of corruption, uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, state uh, uh, weaknesses, uh, and we have the, uh, sent the message uh, at this time of need. So, uh, there has been a sea change as far as Greece is concerned and the region, there is no doubt about it. And let me put it briefly that this is a region that uh, the Greek presence historically has been very strong, obviously, from time immemorial. Um, <clears throat> and uh, certainly uh, from the great conquest of Alexander the Great and ever since. Uh, culturally, culturally uh, uh, under a strong Greek uh, uh, influence. But it is true that with the rise of uh, Arab nationalism, especially uh, radical Arab nationalism, uh, these historical connections were uh, severe. Uh, the Greeks of Egypt were expelled uh, in the 1950s. And uh, for some time, uh, the region uh, uh, was left in the back burner of Greek uh, interest, uh, which was totally uh, Western-oriented and integrating uh, with Europe. In the 80s, there was some return in the region, not always in um, a, a Western positive way. Uh, the, uh, the Greek uh, socialist government at the time played around with uh, radical uh, Arab uh, uh, nationalism. Uh, but since then, uh, there has been a sea change. And nowhere this is more obvious than, the, than in the relationship with Israel. Now, Greece was the last country to recognize, the last EU country to recognize uh, uh, Israel uh, de jure only in 1990. But since 2010, the relationship has flourished uh, and has turned uh, strategic, um, not only economic and uh, cultural, but also strategic. Um, we are uh, cooperating in all levels, uh, militarily very, very strong. We are buying uh, 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 weapons, we are developing uh, um, um, defense relationships uh, of all sorts uh, uh, with uh, uh, Israel. And for Israel, I would say, it's existential, uh, the survival of uh, 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 Greek Cyprus that Greek Cyprus, surrounded by uh, Muslim nations uh, and Islamists and, um, and, and not always nice, you know, friendly uh, neighbors, to put it mildly, uh, uh, Greek Cyprus is a stepping stone to the uh, West, to the free world, uh, and it should remain uh, as free and secure from Turkey's uh, pressure as possible. And uh, as an extension, obviously, Greece, uh, uh, as a stabilizing uh, Western-oriented uh, uh, axis. Uh, a second uh, development was Egypt, obviously, and what happened there with the coup of uh, al-Sisi in 2013 and the breakup between Egypt and Turkey as a result of Turkey's uh, support for uh, the Muslim Brothers and Morsi. And uh, um, this has created uh, the dynamics for this emerging uh, 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 cooperation, uh, uh, for sure. Um, now, uh, Greek foreign policy uh, has been very active uh, in this part of uh, uh, the world. Uh, we have signed a partial delineation agreement with Egypt. Um, um, and uh, we are eager to further develop the relationship. We have welcomed the uh, UAE's uh, presence in the East uh, uh, Mediterranean to create a Western-oriented oriented front of stability uh, and not to allow uh, troublemakers uh, to take advantage of the weakening presence of the United States. Um, there are troublemakers, 
uh, uh, anti West and, and outside the uh, EU, Russia, China. And obviously, Turkey has played a very active and uh, not always, uh, to put it mildly, uh, 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 nice uh, game in places like Syria and uh, northern Iraq, in Libya, um, even in Ethiopia and down further south in the uh, Red Sea in Somalia, uh, in a very, very um, extended uh, uh, way. So this is the uh, idea, uh, uh, a, a force of stability um, without excluding anybody always extending a hand of uh, cooperation with anybody willing uh, to pick it up on the basis of, uh, uh, of law. Uh, the troubles in the Eastern Mediterranean uh, uh, can be simple, uh, uh, and the, the, the question is simple. Um, are we going to resolve any uh, question based on uh, the law or based on force? And uh, the answer cannot be but uh, uh, the law. We need to do more with the Europeans who are always, and I finish, I can talk forever. Now, the Europeans are focused. E Europe cannot do many things at the same time, even at the best of times. Uh, European governments are divided. There is a lot of confusion. And they have been totally concentrated on Russia. For them, anything beyond Russia is a distraction. I go all the time to the Council of Europe, to the meetings of the national parliaments of Europe. I'm representing Greece everywhere. And for the Balts and the Poles and the Slovaks and the Slovenes and the Czechs and the Scandinavians, anything that has to do with Eastern Mediterranean is an unnecessary distraction. It's almost a pro-Russian unnecessary distraction. They are obsessed. They cannot see the strategic connections. I always try to tell them that what happens in Syria has a lot to do with Russia, that Russia is not... Uh, these uh, southeast connections are all too clear uh, uh, to see. And we should not only focus... I mean, obviously, this is the priority, the war in Ukraine. Uh, but it's always a struggle. Mm -hmm. Uh, Greece can provide, together with a, a few other geostrategically more agile uh, powers like France, uh, this uh, um, uh, direction. Thank you so much, Mr. Sanzer. Mr. Kerry, this talked about the weakening presence of the U.S. in the region. So uh, uh, what grade uh, would you give the U.S. for its approach both to the Eastern Mediterranean and the Abraham Records? Do you see any um, missed opportunities or mistakes that need to be rectified, especially now that the great power competition seems to be on full display with Russia and China demanding dominant roles and rogue regional players like, like Turkey, we talked about Turkey, and Iran uh, seeking to disrupt the region. Also, do you think that more involvement, more engagement, more commitment uh, from allies is necessary? Um, well, first of all, thank you. Thank you all for being here and, and thank you for, for moderating. Thank you for coming all the way from Greece and thank you, Andy, for organizing all of this. Um, let me start with the East Med. Um, if I'm going to give out grades, um, always tough. Uh, I'd give it probably a C plus for the United States. Mm -hmm. um, not a good grade. <laughs> not, not a great grade, but better than maybe it would have been two years ago. Mm -hmm. Remember two years ago, you had the spokesman for the State Department, Ed Price, wouldn't even say the words Abraham Accords. There was that uh, famous uh, exchange with him and Matt Lee, uh, an AP reporter, who said, well, what do you call those? And he says, oh, well, those are normalization agreements. No, no, what was the proper noun for it? Oh, I don't know. It was normalization something. No, what was the name? And he finally said Abraham Accords, and it was like pulling teeth to get him to say it out loud. Well, fast forward to last year, uh, the U.S. helped to broker, uh, at least theoretically, the transfer of power uh, over two islands that uh, uh, belong to Egypt and now will be in the hands of Saudi Arabia, Sanafir and Tehran. Uh, and in the process, that actually prompted the Saudis to recognize the state of Israel, at least on paper. Um, and so that's a very important step forward. Um, and I would also actually add that the collapse of the Iran deal, um, such as it is right now, it's obviously, obviously not entirely dead. But um, as they say in the movie The Princess Bride, it's mostly dead. Um, uh, and and I think the sense that that is losing steam right now is giving added uh, impetus for some of these regional actors to coalesce together. Uh, I don't know if that's because of American actions or despite of American actions, mm -hmm. to be honest. Uh, but I think it's an interesting dynamic to watch. But there is still a trust gap 
um, that exists between Washington and a number of Arab capitals. And I think that's really important to point out. The Saudis in particular, that relationship uh, is still not entirely solid. This is still a relationship that I think we were able to, to really observe open mistrust between Washington and Riyadh. Uh, some of this stems from the fact that uh, President Biden, when he was uh, when he was campaigning, uh, said that he wanted to turn Saudi Arabia into, into a pariah state. Well, you know, uh, you'll have to forgive Mohammed bin Salman for not wanting to give President Biden a Nobel Prize. Uh, after uh, after hearing that, you can get a sense about why the Saudis have a certain amount of reticence. But I do think that the Israelis and the Saudis are moving together at their own pace, and I think there's some positive things happening there whether or not the U.S. is involved or not. Mm -hmm. And I think that is probably the greatest takeaway here is that these things are happening despite um, whatever challenges we see in the region. The, the, the Arab states and Israel continue to come together because they see it as being in their own interests. And we saw that recently with uh, Benjamin Netanyahu going to Chad and reestablishing ties there. I think that's really positive. One thing that I'll just note that we're watching at FTD that I think is worth watching writ large is that some of the original peacemakers with Israel are waffling a little bit. The Jordanians are not entirely comfortable with the relationship. And by the way, I would say that Greece's strong relationship with Jordan offers an opportunity to perhaps bring the two sides back together. And we'll talk about Egypt maybe a little bit later, but I see instability there as being highly problematic for the broader construct of normalization and for the East Med. Um, as for the East Med progress, if I'm to give that a grade, probably a B minus, pretty close to a C plus, but maybe a little bit better. Um, and I think it's primarily because the U.S. has not ostracized the countries that are involved. Although I do think that greater involvement is really what's necessary here. You mentioned China and Russia and great power competition. If the U.S. truly wants to secure the East Med as this strategic region, where the U.S. can operate, it can block the tenders of the Chinese, it can block the strategic maneuvers of uh, other great powers that seek to challenge us, well, then that will require greater investment on our part. It's going to inv involve, for example, uh, you know, providing additional weaponry, blocking the weaponry, for example, to countries like Turkey, who are essentially destabilizing this alliance threatening Greece in regular intervals about, you know, invading in the middle of the night, that cannot be tolerated by the United States. And I think the U.S. at some point is going to need to pick sides. It's not to say that we have to jettison Turkey from the transatlantic alliance, but I think we do need to stand on the side of those that have not been provocative and that are trying to work multilaterally. And that's something that I think we need to watch uh, and, um, and, and develop further. I think, by the way, also uh, the U.S. needs to be more forceful in opposing Turkey as it violates the exclusive economic zone of, uh, of Cyprus. I think we ought to be rejecting outright any agreements that Turkey tries to strike with Libya over, uh, over EEZ issues as well. And I think we've just not been as actively engaged as we should be. And that's where I think we've got some negative points against us. But that said, we are still seeing engagement, particularly at the parliamentary and congressional level, which I think is very positive and, and I think where we're probably going to continue to focus for the next several years. Thank you. Mr. Obama, you have written extensively about the military aspect of this uh, regional uh, cooperation, key developments like the new uh, mutual defense cooperation agreement between the United States and Greece and joint exercises like uh, in Neohos. A quick look at the map demonstrates that the U.S. can deal with flashpoints from Ukraine to Yemen with a forward presence in this uh, region. So how can a more integrated Eastern Mediterranean uh, give the U.S. greater power projection capabilities? Thanks so much for the question, and it's a pleasure to join my distinguished colleagues, and I echo, echo the comments about my sympathies to those suffering from what happened uh, recently. Um, yeah, no, there's, this has been a real focus for our center on military and political power here, looking at um, a range of things, including military exercises. And, and uh, you know, there's just, you know, just a couple anecdotal uh, examples I'll offer to you that I think help, uh, help us understand grand strategically what's happening and also kind of lays out uh, awesome opportunities. You know, undoubtedly, the U.S. has at times been uh, unreliable, shall we say, if I'm being polite, if one looks at the Afghanistan withdrawal and the messages that were sent around the world based on that, that disaster, I would say. 
Um, but uh, news of the U.S. departing the region is <coughs> premature, I shall I say. Uh, and I would point you to the Juniper Oak 23 military exercise. Uh, uh, that is the largest military exercise between the U.S. and Israel in history. Uh, the U.S. flowed combat power uh, uh, into that exercise in a way that no country in the world can match, period, period, uh, including four B-52s flying from the United States, coordinating and conducting three waves of attacks on simulated targets after defeating air defense, after teaming up with F, uh, <coughs> Israeli F-35s, supported by F-15s and F-18s. I go on and on and on. Uh, if you're sitting in a place, I don't know, like the Islamic Republic of Iran, that, that message is for you, okay? Uh, so um, yes, uh, we are unreliable at times, but we also continue to understand the importance of the region, and we have combat power that can flow into the region in a way that is unmatched in the world. I was um, reviewing the iteration of this last time in John Shanzer's introduction, I thought really laid out some key points uh, regarding the, hist the historic importance of this region, the, the intersection of maritime routes, energy, and so forth. So I'd point you to that Juniper Oak exercise. It's just an example of, yeah, our posture changes in the region. It's always changing, but don't miss how we can flow combat power into the region. And, and that exercise is speaking to Israel about our rock solid commitment to them. It's speaking to our Arab partners, and it's also speaking to the Islamic Republic of Iran as terror proxies about we retain the means to do what's necessary to protect our interests. I would also applaud uh, Greek for its Ineohos exercise that I've written on a fair amount, and a pleasure to join the podcast a couple times on that. In the past, uh, Greece has invited um, Israel to participate many times. Uh, UAE has participated. Bahrain has participated. I note that Egypt and Jordan have been observers. Wouldn't it be nice if Egypt and Jordan would send combat forces to that exercise? Um, I hope Israel attends again. I would note that the distance between Israel and Greece is roughly equivalent to that between Israel and Iran. And so uh, that provides some valuable uh, rehearsal, shall we say, that might be necessary should Iran move forward with its uh, nuclear weapons program. And, um, and then all this is in the context of another thing we look at is arms sales. And we can talk about this in Q&A if you want to, but F-35 acquisition by Greece, we can talk about that. We also could talk about Turkey's desire to acquire the F-16. I would just highlight a couple of things that I look at uh, on the F-16, F-35 front, if, if it's of interest. One is an F-16 is not an F-35, right? These are very different capabilities, so you have to start there. Uh, when uh, Turkey uh, decided to acquire the S-400, a advanced air and, air and missile defense system from the leading threat to the NATO alliance, not exactly the behavior one would expect of a NATO ally, the United States, despite repeated warnings from Washington, we had no choice but to evict Turkey from the F-35 program. And, and I wrote on that, and that was clear. Um, F-16, F-16 is a fourth generation fighter, even if it's a Block 70 or a newer Block version. Very, very different. And right when I'm starting to think that, you know, hey, maybe we should consider that, I see things like the uh, November 23 airstrike in Turkey, excuse me, in Syria, uh, by Turkey, where uh, U.S. troops' lives were put in danger, right? So, I mean, you know, uh, this is a DOD statement. Re the recent Turkey airstrike in Syria, quote, directly threatened the safety of U.S. personnel who are working in Syria with local partners to defeat ISIS, okay? So my sincere heart goes out to the people of Turkey for the terrorist attacks that they've endured. Terrorism, America has had some terrorist attacks of our own, so that's unacceptable. But we have to find a way forward where we can support our partners in Syria to make sure that we defeat in a durable way the, the ISIS caliphate um, while avoiding irresponsible behavior like we saw in November from Turkey and Syria. And I would just also fl flag what a lot of people may be tracking, the, uh, the accession uh, and with deference to the ambassador of, of Finland and Sweden to, to the NATO alliance. I would just note that the, uh, the initial paperwork was exchanged at NATO headquarters in June, June 29th of last year. That's when this all started. All except two countries have now ratified the accession of those two countries. Who's left? <laughs> Turkey and Hungary. Uh, um, and uh, you know, it, it's uh, and the last country to add itself was Slovakia on September 27th. So I'm no mathematician. That's four months ago. So delaying, slow rolling. I'd say for cynical political purposes, the accession of Finland and of Sweden in time when we need to have unity and strength from NATO and not division and weakness. So I keep going, but I'll stop. Then.
Thank you. Mr. Edelman, back to you. Mr. Sanders said a while ago that if the U.S. really wants to secure this region, it needs to do more. So how can the U.S. best support regional integration? It's clear that more involvement would help, but can you please identify some diplomatic opportunities or some diplomatic initiatives that could facilitate this uh, involvement? I mean, the three plus one comes to mind. Maybe the establishment of a special coordinator for the Abraham Accords or the Eastern Mediterranean, the Department of State. Uh, what are your thoughts? So I think first we have to start with what are some of the uh, obstacles to having a more focused U.S. approach uh, to the region. And uh, one of the main obstacles is that the region, uh, qua region, sits astride a lot of uh, bureaucratic divides in the United States. So it, it sits athwart um, the dividing lines between the European Affairs Bureau and the Near Eastern Affairs Bureau. It sits athwart the uh, uh, lines between uh, of the unified uh, command plan between uh, the European Command and Central Command. And as a former U.S. ambassador to Turkey, I had to live with that. I mean, it is a, a very real obstacle to uh, sort of a concentrated uh, approach to the region as a whole. By the way, Eastern Med is not unique in that regard. I mean, uh, one of our colleagues on the panel uh, talked about um, some of the unhelpful Turkish involvement in the Horn of Africa. The Red Sea has the same uh, issue because it too sits athwart bureaucratic and um, uh, military command lines. Some of this, I would say, has been eased a bit by moving uh, Israel from uh, where it used to sit in the Unified Command Plan in European Command to Central Command. And I don't, uh, as I might have said in an earlier part of my career, it's, it's not an accident, comrade, that, that, um, that Juniper Oak uh, was conducted in the manner it was uh, since the transfer of Israel from European to Central, Central Command. Uh, the other uh, obstacle is if you think that the EU has trouble dealing with more than one big thing at a time, I, I promise you it's uh, even more the case with the US government, which has a lot of difficulty dealing with more than one big national security issue at a time. And uh, the Biden administration, I think, was in the early days very preoccupied with Afghanistan and certainly the disastrous withdrawal, as Brad mentioned. Uh, but of course, since February 24th of last year, it's been very preoccupied by the war in Ukraine for good and sufficient reason. But uh, all of that tends to distract from paying uh, adequate uh, attention to, uh, to this region. Um, I, I think that's manifested itself, for instance, in lack of attention to uh, productive fora like the Middle East Gas Forum. I mean, this was... Uh, People who know me know that I'm pretty sparing in my um, compliments to the Trump administration. Uh, but you know, the fact that Secretary Pompeo attended the Middle East Gas Forum obviously was a, a signal of serious, high-level U.S. attention to this region and to this um, part of the world. Uh, the failure for you know, this administration to actually pay adequate attention to uh, regional fora like that was underscored by an early statement poo-pooing the economic viability of uh, moving gas out of the region to Europe, which is now assumed a much higher priority given the urgent need to get Europe off its dependence on Russian gas. Um, so there's a huge strategic imperative, it seems to me, to... Um, the administration uh, to um, to get on this, and I, I, for the moment, it seems that they've decided to leave this in the hands of their special envoy for uh, energy, um, uh, Ambassador uh, Amos Hochstein. But uh, it seems to me that, given what what John, what others on the panel have been saying, the region has many more issues than simply the energy piece. The energy piece is very, very important, but uh, there are a lot of other pieces, including uh, the stability of Syria, including uh, relations with Israel and expansion of the Abraham Accords, et cetera. So uh, it does seem to me that appointing a special envoy 
uh, for the Eastern Med um, makes a certain amount of sense to try and pull together the various strands, both uh, substantively and bureaucratically, uh, of U.S. policy for for this region, and I would um, I, I would ap ap approve of that. I, if I could, I would like to add just a couple of comments on two other issues that have come up in the panel. One is I, uh, the, the anti-Westernism we've seen on display uh, in Turkey, sadly, is, I'm afraid, more than just a reflection of the current election campaign in Turkey. Uh, a lot of it has to do with uh, and it's not just the AKP government either, I'm sorry to say, but also uh, trends uh, in the opposition as well, pouring this kind of poison into the uh, Turkish body politic. Now, if the fact that the government has a virtual monopoly on the media in Turkey just means that there's you know, been uh, very little to cut uh, against, against that, um, and unfortunately it's ongoing. I suspect that the comments by the interior minister, Minister Soylu, yesterday to the American ambassador, Jeff Flake, that he should keep his dirty hands off Turkey was probably one of the more spectacularly ill-timed uh, interventions by a government official that I can think of, uh, given what's sadly what's happened uh, last evening and, and this morning in, uh, in Turkey. Um, and then finally, just to add to what Brad said about um, Finland and um, and Sweden's accession to NATO and the Turkish veto. Hopefully the Hungarian problem will be uh, taken care of this month when the Hungarian parliament comes back into, into session. Um, I think Andy, Andy mentioned in the um, introduction that um, I was both ambassador to Finland and Turkey. I think the Venn diagram of people who have had both, I think you're, you're looking at it. I mean, um, so um, I would say this. First of all, I think uh, it's clearly, as Brad said, um, been motivated uh, by uh, short-term political advantage uh, for President Erdogan. Uh, there are some genuine issues with Sweden and, and uh, support for the PKK. Those can, I think, be easily managed if there's a will to do so on both sides. Clearly, it's being exploited for other, other purposes. I think there's a stunning failure to recognize uh, the incredible symbolic, and not just symbolic, but substantive strategic advantages of Finland and Sweden's accession to NATO. These are two countries that bring to the alliance more military capability than any new member of the alliance has brought with it since the accession of Poland in 1997. These are two countries that have serious defense industries in a period of time when the US and the West are gonna have to um, once again step up military production uh, in order to uh, remain the arsenal of democracy around the world. Uh, these are two countries that uh, provide access to the Arctic through the high north, which is increasingly, to your point, Lena, a, 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 a space for um, a great power uh, competition with both Russia and China uh, showing interest in, in the Arctic. Um, and the fact that um, both Ericsson and Nokia, two incredibly important uh, industrial partners and 5G telecommunications are now part of the Western Alliance uh, will be, I think, in the long run, very, very important with regard to competition with China. So Turkey's holding this up is a huge deal. And I don't think some Turkish officials understand uh, how much antipathy they are stirring up, you know, in, in the alliance. Uh, John correctly, I think, said we can't really expel Turkey. There's no mechanism for doing that, notwithstanding the um, op-ed written by a former U.S. national security advisor recently. <laughs> um, but I, I do think Turkey ought to take note of the fact that this is really creating enormous ill will in the rest of the alliance for Turkey. And that's something that will not go away after Finland and Sweden have exceeded, I hope, uh, by the time that we have the summit in Vilnius. 
you want to say May something? I just interject oh, quickly? Sorry. I don't. I don't want to mess up your plan. Nope. <laughs> but no, I just completely agree with the ambassador on the uh, on his statement that the addition of these two countries to the NATO alliance is an asset, not a liability. We, we published on this last year to kind of laying out the military details on that. And you know, we use the word deterrence a lot. It's it's a favorite word in, in DC, and not everyone understands what it means. There's we can I can geek out on it for a while, but I won't. But the big idea is just on layman's terms. You want to create, create dilemmas for your adversaries that are so tough to solve, they don't try the aggression in the first place. That's kind of, you know, that's how I would explain it to my family back in Oregon, right? That's, that's essentially deterrence. Um, imagine the kind of dilemmas we create for Russian military planners if you have Finland and Sweden fully in the NATO alliance, right? You, you say, oh, well, wait, you know, we worked with Finland and Sweden a long time. We do exercises with them. Yes, but when someone's in the alliance, you can make assumptions in your war plans. And the Russians know that. So we talk about, oh, that long border with Finland, right? Oh, that's a real liability for, is it a liability or is it an asset? Is it an asset, right? Because if you're Russia and you want to do something obnoxious in the Black Sea region, once they're in the alliance, you have to be worrying about counterattacks or counteraction along that long common border with Finland. NATO is not an aggressive alliance. NATO is not Napoleon in terms of invading Russia. NATO is not Nazi Germany. Everyone knows that. Vladimir Putin knows it. But the beauty of these two countries in the alliance is it creates dilemmas that decrease the chance of Russian aggression, not increase it. Um, so just wanted to offer that. Mr. Karidis, let's go back from the NATO enlargement, which of course of paramount importance to regional integration. And perhaps a solid starting point for this process would be to try to involve European partners to Middle East institutions and uh, vice versa. The EU has association agreements with Israel and Egypt. There has been talk of European states becoming uh, members of uh, the Negev Forum. What role Greece can play in, during this process? It can play a very important role. Uh, I was in Stockholm the other day because Sweden has the EU presidency this semester. I can tell you that the Swedes are in shock. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't expect it. They totally underestimated. it. They are not used to be part of a controversy. This is a country that has been praised and has been uh, accustomed to praise uh, internationally for uh, its human rights records, for its democratic record, and suddenly uh, they have to deal uh, with Mr. Soilu and uh, uh, all these other unpleasant uh, people uh, in uh, Ankara. Uh, for sure is a very big prize. And I think it is uh, the accession of Sweden and Finland uh, coming away from a neutrality of centuries when it comes to uh, Sweden, from the time of the Battle of Poltava uh, back in Ukraine in the early 18th century. Uh, and it shows how badly uh, Putin miscalculated. I mean, uh, he had <laughs> a problem with Ukraine acceding and then suddenly uh, Finland and uh, Sweden, two traditionally neutral countries. So it's uh, very important. I would go a, a step further. And I would say that we have uh, anti-EU forces, uh, uh, forces that want to see the disintegration of uh, uh, a European uh, Union, and that we have been naive in how we deal with it. Before I look at how the EU can uh, play a role in the Middle East, first mm -hmm. we have to have an EU, mm -hmm. uh, which is not a, a, a given, it's a constant struggle. And I think what we have seen with the Koran burning, for example, recently, is this uh, underground, hard to prove, but uh, uh, suspective alliance between Erdogan and Putin. Now, uh, Putin, on the one hand, uh, finances extreme right-wing uh, groups and activists in Europe uh, uh, to go around, uh, uh, provoke uh, uh, Muslims, for example, by burning. Suddenly, we started burning out of nowhere uh, uh, Korans outside uh, Turkish embassies. Um, and then we have Erdogan uh, playing the Islamist uh, card. Uh, uh, and you know how many uh, millions of Muslims live in places like France and elsewhere. Uh, to have a row between uh, 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 fascists and Islamists. And we, the European forces of uh, reason in the middle, uh, being the prey and the victim of this kind of uh, polarization. Now, this is not something fantastic and out of uh, uh, the blue. It's something that happened, for example, in the last French elections, uh, parliamentary elections. Uh, President Macron lost his majority, 
uh, in Parliament and uh, made France fairly ungovernable. Now, it was never easy to govern uh, France, but even uh, less so now, uh, because Melanchon took all the Arab vote, the Muslim vote, according to whom, for everything, uh, uh, France is to blame, you know, Algeria and uh, uh, colonialism, etc. And Le Pen took all the uh, uh, French vote, and uh, the center uh, was uh, left uh, weakened. And this is a model that these anti-Europeans anti uh, in Moscow and in Ankara uh, want to repeat elsewhere. And we've seen now this uh, hybrid internal threat uh, within our democracies uh, playing a role. And Europeans have been so strategically naive. I mean, I've spent two days with the Swedes who are defending uh, freedom of speech, you know, et cetera, et cetera, and trying to persuade them I mean, there is nothing freedom of speech burning the Koran. I mean, let's, uh, let's be uh, a little bit more uh, uh, suspicious and serious uh, and not to uh, give uh, excuses uh, 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 to, to be undermined, right? Uh, now, if one is critical of the US, uh, I don't know what uh, one needs to be with the Europeans. I mean, uh, 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 the EU Mediterranean policy uh, was a disaster. Uh, it never uh, worked. Uh, EU is absent uh, in uh, places of vital importance like uh, Syria or uh, uh, Libya. We are totally divided among ourselves. I mean, the Italians are fighting with the French. The French are fighting with the Germans uh, in these uh, uh, issues. We have handed the keys to Europe, to Mr. Erdogan, who controls both the East Mediterranean and the Central Mediterranean route through his uh, uh, support and control of the Tripolis uh, government in Libya. So he can raise the heat and lower the heat, uh, uh, directly affecting uh, uh, EU elections uh, um, in places like Italy and Germany and the rest. And uh, we have been very naive uh, and uh, inactive and almost exhausted from the continuous crisis that we have faced, from the Eurozone, uh, the refugee crisis, the pandemic crisis, now Ukraine. It's been like 10 years. I mean, this is a leadership uh, that is, was not prone, too much prone on stress. And it has been stressed beyond capacity uh, the last uh, uh, 10 years. Uh, Okay. I see the sign. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so Greece, uh, Greece has a vital role to play. Greece is a small country, uh, of course. I don't, we don't have, we don't entertain any, uh, any folie de grand air. Uh, but it can play a disproportionate to its size role because of history, geography. Uh, now, most people don't understand and don't know uh, uh, things like uh, Greece is today supporting energy-wise Bulgaria and Romania. Uh, because we have reverse flow, uh, unlike the Germans who had no LNG uh, terminal, uh, Greece did have one, and through reverse flow now, we are there for East Europeans. Countries where Russian influence is not uh, weak. I mean, Bulgaria is not a country that is 100% on the West. It is a battle to be fought in Bulgaria and in Romania, and Greece is helping that battle. Now, if the war in, uh, in Ukraine is an Orthodox Christian, inter-Orthodox Christian war, uh, war among Christian Orthodox, the Greeks being the oldest Christian Orthodox uh, uh, people, uh, with the ecumenical patriarchate in uh, Constantinople, in Istanbul, and the other patriarchates in Jerusalem, in Alexandria, there is a war there. The Russians are picking up on uh, Greek parishes, in Africa, in the Middle East, through money, there is an, so it's, it's a multifaceted front where the Greeks, because of history, have an understanding that, to put it mildly, the Luxembourgians and the Belgians lack. <laughs> and we are trying to mobilize these sources. We have some successes. Um, we have moved away from the inertia of Merkelism, uh, I don't want to go into Angela Merkel now. Uh, we will take uh, hours uh, uh, to criticize. Uh, but we have a very long way still uh, to go for sure.
Thank you very much. All of you gentlemen talked a lot about uh, Iran and Turkey. So, Mr. Sanzer, is the US doing enough to counter the malign influence of factors who work over time to obstruct integration? Uh, is the US setting distinct red lines and limits? Is the US sending clear messages to the troublemaker uh, of the region? Uh, what do you think? Well, I can shorten my answer very quickly to just say no. Okay. Um, <laughs> or I can go into maybe just a, a few you can, minutes. You can give us some. Uh, uh, I'll take just a few minutes. I mean, look, Turkey, I think we already know uh, we're seeing the provocative statements in ways that I think, I mean, I think it's unprecedented uh, with Turkey directly threatening Greece. Um, uh, a fellow NATO ally makes the in invocation of Article 5 a, a bit odd, uh, <laughs> to, to put it mildly, right? If they ever fe uh, followed through on some of these threats, visiting Greece in the middle of the night, the sort of rhetoric that we're seeing out of the Erdogan government, the, uh, the violations of the exclusive economic zone of Cyprus is a huge problem. The meddling in Libya is another problem. The sponsorship of Hamas in the Gaza Strip, which is, of course, still threatening uh, the East Med as, as we know it. Another problem, uh, Turkey has got its hands in a lot of places where it should not. And, um, and rather than the U.S. taking definitive measures to punish, as we discuss, you know, the F-16 deal is still on the table. Mm -hmm. Admittedly, they've cut off F-35, but I don't know if that's enough. I don't know if that message has been delivered. Of course, it's a balancing act when you consider the fact that the Turks hold the, uh, the accession of Finland and Sweden in their hands. At the same time, this is the balancing act that we're watching, but you can certainly see that the Turks are not playing a positive role. Another actor that I think we obviously need to keep an eye on is Iran. Um, it really, the preeminent malign actor in the region, destabilizing uh, Gaza, uh, of course, uh, completely gutting the state in Lebanon to the point that Hezbollah has now taken over, the key sponsor of Syria, um, right? I mean, there's just virtually nowhere that you don't see the fingerprints of Iran in ways that have deteriorated or undermined security in the region. And that really, again, you know, we hope anyway from the U.S. perspective is that uh, you know we take the Iran deal, the nuclear deal, completely off the table. We take uh, sanctions relief completely off the table. Begin to impose penalties, maybe even try to hasten the downfall of the regime with some of the actors that have been coming out into the streets. This would be, I think, a positive thing on the part of the U.S. and would be some uh, wind in the sails of uh, of of this sort of new regional architecture. Two other actors that I'll just mention briefly, the Qataris, I think, are actors to keep an eye on. They're the financial sponsors traditionally of the Turks. Um, hot cash flowing into, uh, into Turkey to keep the economy afloat. And they have this sort of joint mechanism, a joint view of how they want to spread Islamism and Muslim Brotherhood ideology across the region. I don't know if it gets enough attention. And by the way, at the same time, you see the Qataris using their vast wealth and malign influence to buy off members of parliament, um, be really undermining the very democratic structures in Greece, yes. Greece and Brussels. beyond. And, and right, I mean, you're Greek parliamentarian, you've got the, the European parliament. These are things that really should not be tolerated. And I don't know why it's been still relatively muted up until now. Um, the last actor that I'll just note, and I think it's obvious, it's the Russians using uh, energy as a weapon, which, by the way, gives us added motivation to support the East Med structures as they're developing, right? This is the alternative. But in the meantime, the Russians are obviously uh, making a mess out of the region. Uh, the Russians are, of course, controlling the skies over Syria. So they've got an East Med perch over there. Uh, which is limiting the ability of the Israelis to interdict weapons in Lebanon. Um, we also have seen reports of the Russians backing the Wagner Group in Libya. So we've got a lot of problems on our hands. These are the main, I guess, four actors that threaten the structures as we know it. And one last question for you, Mr. Baumann, before we go to our Q&A session. There's quite a difference between the diplomacy that we're witnessing and an actual military uh, cooperation. What the benefits of such a cooperation would be for the U.S. and how a military alliance like that can be achieved, can be established in terms of uh, creating military compatibility and security cooperation? Sure, thanks. I can be real quick because I'm excited to get to questions. And um, you know, the I think the bottom line is that the the security cooperation between the U.S. and Greece is as strong as it's been, arguably, maybe ever, or certainly in a long, long time. 
Uh, in July of last year, the Greek defense minister met with Secretary Austin in the Pentagon. And if you didn't see that statement, it's, it's worth taking note of. Secretary Austin cited two examples of how Americans benefit from this growing security cooperation with Greece. One was the continued access at Suda, uh, of U.S. naval forces at Suda Bay, which helps uh, make our uh, regional military posture more effective and more powerful to deter aggression, as we were talking about earlier. And he also cited the uh, priority access that we now enjoy at the port of Alexandropolis, which, we, uh, which uh, Andy talked about in his introduction. Um, and I would just hi uh, highlight from 2020 to 2021, according to New York Times, there was a 14-fold increase in the amount of U.S. military equipment going through that port. Uh, and then by mid-year last year, we had already increased that amount from 2021. I mean, we're talking about thousands of pieces of military equipment going through that port, going up and reinforce. So we talk, hey, let's reinforce NATO's southeastern flank. That sounds real nice in the beltway, right? Okay, how do you do that? How do you do that when you, ha you don't have unfettered access up through the Black Sea via maritime routes? Well, you're doing that through that port of Alexandropolis. And I'm so thankful that we've worked with our Greek allies to make sure that Russians aren't running that port or the Chinese aren't running that port. And so that's just an example of, you know, we're often on the losing and, oh, shoot, China's running that port. They're running that port. Oh, gosh, darn, what do we do? Finally, we're starting to get ahead of it. And we're building Greeks, uh, 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 Greece's defense capabilities. We're strengthening our posture, and we're making smart decisions like we did at the port that are good for NATO, good for Greece, and good for the United States and all of us in regional security. Thank you, Thank you Brad. I see Eddie is having the microphone over there. <laughs> He's waiting for your questions, so we can. All right. Okay, so you can help us, Eddie. We're going to try to get a few questions in. Henri Barkey. Um, thank you. Uh, two, two questions. One is for Eric. What happens if Turks block only Sweden um, for some time to come? I mean, I'm assuming Erdogan is going to win the election and he may still be angry. And Dimitri, uh, you, you talked about the populist, in, in, you know, the votes, that, the, how the Russians are using uh, populist parties. What about Italy? What's your take on Italy? Because we, we know very little about Italy given the new government and you have been obviously interacting with them. Thank you. Well, uh, briefly, Henri, I think <clears throat> um, there's already been, as you know, a lot of speculation both in the Finnish and Turkish press about the possibility of, a, uh, of the Turkish Grand National Assembly approving Finland and holding Sweden in abeyance. The formal position, I think, of the um, Finnish government is they still <laughs> intend to proceed in tandem with Sweden, much as they did um, for EU membership back in the early 1990s. Um, you know, I, I think there's a potential that you could see that happen. And if after May 14th, there's, you know, some kind of accommodation with the Swedes, as long as it's all done in time to have them both at the table uh, at Vilnius and the summit, I think there's a possible path there to get through this. I think a long-term um, sort of veto on Sweden will will cause you know really deep uh, alienation between everyone else in NATO and Turkey, and and be I think enormously costly to Turkey in the long run, w way more than any possible benefit they could get. You know, I think it's too early to say what the cost will be because I think it's going to take time for people to assimilate all this and then figure out how they're going to make Turkey pay a price. But I think people will want to extract a price from Turkey for doing this. I mean, there is a great paradox in all this, for sure, because officially Turkey still wants to join EU, where Sweden is a member. So Sweden is bad in NATO, but it's okay as an EU uh, partner. And obviously Erdogan is trying to divide the two. He's already hinting at that. And uh, this is an additional horror in Stockholm. Now, going back to the strategic alliance with uh, uh, America, I just want to share with you uh, a, an a experience I uh, recently had uh, back in September under the Acropolis. There is a famous open air theater from ancient times called uh, Irodio. 
Now, in the good old days, a U.S. ambassador would never appear in, in, in front of 5,000 uh, people. And <clears throat> the security is very difficult because it's very steep and uh, it's not easy to control, etc., etc. Now, this September, I was there for a concert and Ambassador Junis, uh, the U.S. ambassador, entered and he was received as a rock star. <laughs> I mean, the whole theater, 5,000 Athenians stood up uh, on their hill uh, and clapping and uh, applauding. And uh, uh, he enjoyed it <laughs> <laughs> and he reciprocated. I mean, this shows you what the, change, yeah. <laughs> the change uh, uh, in uh, uh, people's feelings. I mean, we always had a very uh, strong and uh, 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 historic relationship. I mean, uh, modern Greece was uh, uh, born out of a revolution that was an extension of the American and the French Revolution. And we all fought uh, together from the same side throughout the 20th century. We, never, uh, we were always on the same side of history, the good side of history. And uh, we remain with Ukraine now, despite, uh, and, and, and very strongly so, despite the historical connection but, uh, that we have with Russia. But um, <laughs> this kind of uh, popular feeling towards a U.S. ambassador uh, is, uh, is, is, is incredible. I mean, it, it, I, was, I was really taken uh, aback. <coughs> now, Italy. Italy is a positive surprise. Um, obviously, uh, 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 they are not. I, I am a center right uh, uh, politician, um, and they are not necessarily my cup of tea, Mrs. Meloni. She does not belong to the EPP, to the European People's Party uh, center right coalition. Uh, she is to our uh, right. Uh, but uh, uh, she was pro NATO, anti Russia. Uh, um, uh, compared to some of your coalition partners that, uh, to put it mildly, have accepted gifts uh, from Vladimir uh, in the past, uh, both Mr. Salvini and Mr. Uh, Berlusconi. Uh, now, the Italians um, have an, a generic problem because for them foreign policy is all about trade. It's about selling goods. They have these big industries, uh, in, industrial interests in, in northern Italy. And basically, the Italian government is an extension of any and uh, uh, fiat and, uh, uh, I mean, openly so. I mean, I was in Rome two weeks ago because we have a very peculiar, complex, strong, close and difficult relationship with the Italians. Um, um, in order to try to see eye to eye vis-a-vis -vis Libya, um, where we have our difficulties, etc. Overall, uh, Meloni is uh, uh, better, uh, than, uh, 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 better than expected. By the way, it's good that after 15 years, since 2008, we have a political government, not a technocratic uh, one, an elected government. Because, you know, in Italy they have elections and then uh, uh, they put a technocrat. You know, they, they, there is the charade, put it mild, you know, jokingly, of elections. But then it's not the politicians who are the elected politicians. They ask uh, Monti or uh, Prodi or uh, uh, Draghi. Uh, uh, to govern. So for the first time after 15 years, we have a strong, stable uh, coalition with Meloni in, in, in charge. Uh, and um, Italy can play return after 25 years of absence, take advantage of Brexit as the third, you know, to add into the French-German axis. So it's an interesting uh, uh, thing. Uh, uh, happening. Uh, Mr. Gerides, we're running out of yeah. time. Well, I think we'll have a few more minutes, maybe one or two more two, questions, Eddie. One, two. Sorry. Great, great. Thank you guys so much. Um, it's been really great hearing uh, all the great things you guys have to say. So I have, I have two part question here. Um, I'd love to talk about the three plus one interparliamentary group. So Greece, Cyprus, Israel, and the United States. Um, we'd just love to hear a little bit more. We talked a lot about what the administration could be doing better in terms of expanded cooperation and, and work in the East Med. Would love to hear a little bit more about what you think Congress can do and what the interparliamentary group could do together. Um, and then my second question, part question is a, is a bit of a leading one, so bear with me, but the authorization for three plus one interparliamentary group um, authorizes the Senate to participate um, in, the, in the interparliamentary group, but does not authorize, authorize the House to participate, House members to participate. So I was hoping you guys could, could speak a little bit to what challenges that might pose um, to interparliamentary co group cooperation or congressional cooperation 
um, when you only have uh, one one chamber that's involved in that progress. Thank you. Uh, sure, who wants to take the sure, question? You know what, we'll put Cliff's question too, so. Oh. Uh, yeah, and that's gonna be the last yeah. question. Uh, I was going to throw something out here and let somebody respond to it. Um, as of Friday, there was a report in the Wall Street Journal that said at least 13 Turkish firms exported a total of 18.5 million worth of items, including plastic rubbers and vehicles, to at least Tatarshan companies sanctioned by the U.S. for their role in Russia's assault on the Ukraine. That seems to me to be a relevant thing to discuss, given what we're up to. Gentlemen, who wants to I recommend to Brad is the only one who's actually uh, worked and, on the Hill to perhaps talk about yes. these. And maybe Dimitri about oh. the three plus one. Oh. Yes, Brad, let's I was going to, okay. <laughs> uh, well, you know, yeah, nine years U.S. Senate, so I'm a little biased for the upper chamber. So if you have to start with one of them, I say you start with the Senate. But uh, more broadly, uh, I would say... Uh, Interparliamentary exchanges are a positive thing. Uh, I've sat through more than my fair share of meetings with my former senator bosses where they were meeting with parliamentarians from other countries. And, and I know my bosses and, and myself at the humble staff level found those to be incredibly useful, uh, incredibly constructive and productive. And so I'm, uh, it sounds kind of touchy feely, like, oh, let's just get together and talk. But I found them to be very, very positive. And I think the more that we can uh, have this with our, our key allies and partners, the better. And I would agree that uh, it would be stronger if you had both the Senate and House of Representatives uh, participating. It's just as a, from my uh, Senate staffer background, that'd be my humble opinion on that. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. If, if the ambassador or anyone else wants to add to that. Dimitri? Uh, starting from the last, there is no doubt in my mind, I have said it time and again in the various European fora I participate, that uh, Turkey is playing a role of black marketeer, marketeer uh, in uh, uh, Ukraine, making money out of it, very important money for Erdogan because his economy is in shambles. And as he moves towards uh, elections, one can only look at the accounts of the Turkey Central Bank to understand the flow of money from Russia uh, into uh, his coffers. Uh, and for, Erdo for Putin, it's very important to have Erdogan re-elected, and he will do everything possible. We know how he mingled with our elections in the past. You know it very well here in that side of the Atlantic and in Brexit and in the French presidential elections in 2017. For him, uh, the Turkish election is very uh, important, and uh, Erdogan is breaking the sanctions uh, left and right and uh, making, it, uh, m making us all look full. Uh, to our electorate. Now, imagine how difficult it is for a Greek legislator, for a Greek parliamentarian, to go to the Greek people, as I do every day through my various TV appearances, to persuade them that we need to send more weapons and support more Ukraine when our next door, next door neighbor makes money out of the uh, war. I mean, here is Greece traditionally, culturally, historically, friendly towards Russia for a number of reasons I'm not going to uh, explain further. And we have to make this sacrifice. We cut all the tourist uh, trade, all the uh, this and that. And Turkey is making a profit. I mean, it makes us all look like fool because my uh, voters ask me, uh, why should we bear the sacrifice? That's a, that's and, a question that we have here yeah. in the United States but as well. If you want to say a few words the about three the three plus, plus one, one, and we have to wrap it's, up. There is nothing, uh, and I'm, I'm biased, obviously, as a legislator, uh, but I very much believe in uh, uh, parliamentary uh, diplomacy. Uh, because you get the gut feeling of uh, the people. I mean, government is obviously has the priority and takes the lead, but there is nothing like parliamentarians speaking to each other because they represent uh, the real people. I mean, when I speak to my Polish counterparts or the Hungarians, you know, so those uh, unpleasant people from Fidesz, you really get uh, the, the, the gut of the matter, right? Mm -hmm. As you say. And the same goes with the parliamentary. Now, if you add to that, that you are speaking with the U.S. Senate and that you, uh, uh, the whole thing is chaired by Bob Menendez, who, um, contrary to our systems, because we are important, but we are not that important in our own division of power. But here in America, I understand that the head of the U.S. Senate uh, Foreign Relations Committee is uh, b b b second only to the president when it comes to foreign policy. Third, fourth, okay. Uh, I wish I was fourth. I wish I was fourth in my place. So, we have very important work to do, and it shows how close the relationship okay. is uh, between the Knesset, <clears throat> the Cypriot House of Representatives, the Hellenic Parliament, and uh, uh, the U.S. Senate. Yes. And obviously, if we can bring in the House, so much the better. One last uh, word from Jonathan. Yeah, just in, in answer to Cliff's question, um, we at FTD for 
quite some time have been tracking the illicit financial flows out of Turkey. Um, they are significant, and they go back now for the better part of two decades. There was uh, the famous case now known as Gas for Gold that uh, entailed Turkey moving about $20 billion on behalf of the Iranian regime at the height of the sanctions regime, the support for Hamas, the support for the Islamic State at one point, the support for al-Qaeda-related groups in Syria. Um, the sheer amount of illicit activity, by the way, we see indications of Venezuela uh, sanctions busting. This is, and now we're seeing it in the Black Sea. And, and there's, of course, questions about what, whether Russia should be designated as a state sponsor of terrorism itself. Fine. But I would just say, broadly speaking, Turkey has now solidified its place, uh, at least in my view, within the U.S. policy structures as it, a state sponsor of terrorism in its own right. It is a jurisdiction of illicit finance concern that cannot be ignored. The question is, quite frankly, what do we do about it? And I think that's very relevant to our discussion today as we think about supporting this uh, burgeoning structure in the East Med. There is really one major menace right now, and that is Turkey. And it is undermining so much of the um, efforts that we're trying to push forward. Gentlemen, thank you very much for this fantastic uh, discussion. Thank you all for being here. There are uh, many panels and discussion around the city today yes. and tomorrow. So make sure to attend.